Art, Aids, and Retrospection. Two powerhouse artists from the 1980s, David Warnerovich and Peter Hujar, are receiving their first major retrospectives more than two decades after their deaths. It's cause for celebration, but also self-reflection, say our guests. Curators David Keel from the Whitney Museum and Joel Smith from the Morgan Library and Museum. They're joined by artist and educator Pamela Sneed in a discussion of the ongoing difficult work of inclusion. That plus a performance from Sneed right here in our studio. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The New York Times Style Magazine recently dedicated an entire issue to the 1980s, what the editors called a time on fire. From Perry Ellis to hip hop, the period gave us a lot. But what is getting especially close attention now is the art that arose out of the AIDS epidemic, a disease that the president's communications director of the time called nature's revenge on gay men. That was Patrick Buchanan. By the time President Reagan actually said the word AIDS, the disease had spread to 113 countries, killed over 20,000 Americans, and infected twice that number. Is it just time passing that is bringing this period back into vision, or is it its resonance in another time that feels kind of aflame? This year, the art world is seeing two major retrospectives of artists of that period at the Morgan Library, Peter Hujar, Speed of Life, at the Whitney Museum, David Warnerovich, History Keeps Me Awake at Night. The two artists' lives intertwined, absolutely personal, adamantly political, formal, Furious, playful, profane, you'll find singularity and solidarity and all of the above in these shows. What do they have to do with now, though, with the art and activism of today? We're going to delve into that question and a whole lot more, I'm sure, with my guests today. David Keel is Curator Emeritus at the Whitney. Joel Smith is the Richard Menschel Curator of the Morgan Library and Museum. We're also joined by artist, author, and educated Pam educator Pamela Sneed. She's a member of the Board of Visual Aids. And last summer, she was part of doing a program celebrating the great poet and essayist, whom the Times forgot, Audre Lorde, with David Warnerovich. Let's start there. Pamela, welcome to this. Welcome Thank all. You. Thank you. And I'm also a performer. You <laughs> certainly are. We'll see some more about that later. Mm -hmm. um, what does this work mean to you? Let's start with the work that we're going to be talking about today. Well, one of the things that I focused on for the program last year with visual aids was the idea that both Audre Lorde and David Wanarovich were sort of transformed by illness, mm. right? And so that was the catalyst to make them sort of these political spokespeople or spokespersons of their time, right? Um, and so I was interested in that. So, you know, she had cancer and, um, and she wrote, you know, the transformation of silence into language and action. And then David also spoke about silence and he has that image, you know, with his mouth sewn, you know, mm -hmm. shut. Um, and so they were two really great visionaries. And I feel like the catalyst was, you know, was illness, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, so that's where I sort of like began. Um, and I was also talking about like sometimes, um, what is it? I'm in conversation with like Greg Bordowitz and I, I feel like Audre Lorde and, you know, <laughs> and David having a conversation yeah. in this era. Um, but I also, I talk a lot to students about both of them. Um, I feel like they need in this era the sense of the politics that came before, the, the urgency, um, how to overcome silence. Um, again, we're living in a very, you know, tumultuous time. We have a toxic leader, a toxic party. Um, and so how do we fight and how do we know what came mm. before? And then also the, you know, for David, 
um, you know, one that he gave voice to like, you know, talking about like child abuse and all that. And also, but they were also so interdisciplinary. Yeah. When I look at Hujar's like, you know, um, bio and I look at David's bio, it's like they were, you know, they were poets, they were musicians, they, had, you know, they had everything going on. And I think it's really important that, that we can look at the interdisciplinary yeah. nature. Both artists, David in particular, who perceived commercial success as artistic failure. Um, they, they were very skeptical of sort of being accepted by the art world. I mean, David had a show in the mid 80s, where, which he was very worried about, very concerned that it would somehow ruin his creativity. He s sort of stopped painting for a while because he didn't want to, he didn't like the sort of the feeding frenzy right. of, the, of the art world. And then he, think about the time that Peter was sick and he went back to painting and I think it's also maybe the changes that happened in his painting come because of this sort of profound relationship that the two artists had. Well that was the next thing I was going to ask you about was about their relationship and how their lives intertwined. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well Paul? Hujar is somebody who um, has a, a childhood that he can certainly draw in parallel with Wanarovich's. He's not... He's about 20 years older though, right? Exactly right. And uh, uh, he was able to look at him and say, here's somebody who I, I have the chance in some way, this is entirely my projection, uh, <laughs> to make good on the things that I knew I needed when I was young but that I never had. And his advice to Wanarovich from the beginning is spend time not thinking about whether you're selling work. Spend time on your work, and that's uh, indicative of the kind of um, connection that he sees to him. I was going to say that David's, the real vocal part of the activism against AIDS comes around the time Peter is diagnosed. Mm -hmm. He had also had close friends who had been dying, and he talks about that, but the same point there's the writing side of him and the art side of him, and the art side has a lot going on also with something he was very interested, I think very interested in, is the destruction of, by civilization, of the natural world, of natural culture, indigenous culture. It's all the way through, you know, the, um, how we are destroying our world this world of machines and how it's gobbling us up. And that sort of runs through a lot of, I think, his classic paintings. The but House of Fire. It is not the, um, I mean, there, there's so many sides of David and I think he was almost like a volcano ready to erupt. And that's why I love that image of David in flames. <laughs> to go back though to this question of the economics and the demographics and the violence of the period, um, he can't help but be struck by the fact that the beautiful New Whitney is on property right there that in this period was a stroll for um, transvestites and hookers, was uh, on the way to the piers where a lot of this work had its roots in the, on the art pier that I once visited early in the morning, not late at night. Um, and you could see this incredible work on the walls, but an underculture, a, a subculture. Do we still have that? I mean, no, a lot what's of happened to that? Of color. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in like, in, in how we, how like, I mean, I think like, um, you know, looking at both of their works, Hujar and Wanarovich, I mean, I think it's so like pioneering and, and I, I feel like it's so important to like sort of like document their works. And then on the other hand, I always feel like with like, you know, the invisibility of one, then there's there's some way that some other group becomes invisible. And so how do those, those words, I mean, how do those worlds like sort of, you know, come together, do you know? Like how, how do people of color, you know, uh, how are they seen? How do we get seen, you know, mm -hmm. of that period? I mean, Cheryl Sutton is one of the few people of color in this pitch, in this, uh, um, in these shows, the, the dancer. Mm -hmm. So it's what's in it, but it's also what's left out. Uh, certainly. I think the, the basis for Hujar really doesn't come from a political analysis of any kind. Um, he would be the first to say that the work is about outrage, but it's an outrage that's a 
personal uh, response to the world. For that matter, his relationship to AIDS is that of somebody who's been thinking about mortality as a part of his art yeah. from the very beginning. You know, one of his first important bodies of work is photographs of corpses in the catacombs of Palermo, which he photographs in 1963. Yeah. That comes out of a Catholic background as much as anything else, um, and out of a sense of connection with Paul Tech, the artist with whom he was visiting the catacombs um, that day. Um, and so I think there's a lot uh, in Hujar, who's living in the village from the early 1950s onward, before he's even done with high school, uh, that has to do with the, the sources of his personal mm -hmm. sense of disempowerment and, uh, and uh, rage that simply dovetail with a lot of the political instincts that Wanarovich has mm -hmm. and, uh, and make perfect sense, but a different kind of sense. And when the two of them come together, it adds mm -hmm. up to something bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of the project of the exhibitions, it seems to me, is to revive this conversation. Is that right? I, for me, it was a case of reviving. David, for, I think for a long time, was known as the writer, as the artist. So much of the work st had stayed with the people who owned it mm -hmm. because they loved the work. And I think if there's one work, it's one day this boy or one day this kid, is the one work that sort of got out there. Um, the Buffalo's Falling was the other one because of the U2 record album cover. People knew the writing, but they didn't know this other side of him. And now it's a show, this complexity of, of his brain. And it's a self-taught brain, pretty much. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because the shows, I mean, I've, I've heard so many people's different reactions to going to see the shows. So, a, a mutual friend of ours, Amy Shoulder, who was one of David's first publishers, um, said she walked into the Peter Hujar show and just cried. Um, I found it very moving to read the essays, to look at the catalogs, not only because of the beauty of the work, and we haven't even talked about the formalism and the, and the genius of the work itself, um, but because of that atmosphere of that period of desperate determination not to die in silence, not to be divided from humanity, that speaks to a desire that wasn't just a gay male desire, wasn't just a 1980s desire, certainly wasn't a white people desire alone. Um, it's that that I feel these shows reignite, or at least the stir. Voice, the voice, the say it, do it, shout it out. The urgency, the aflame, the don't let us be divided feeling. Um, but at the same time, it's, you're, you're right, it, there are divisions that are being revealed too. How would you talk to your students about, I mean, what do you, what do you encourage your students and the people that are coming to these shows to do, to, 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 to get involved in, or, or do you just try to choreograph any of that? Oh, well, I've, I've, I've sent everyone to, you know, the Hoosier show, <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to send everybody to the Wilna Rover show. And, um, and so, and actually I was sitting in a studio with a student the other day, and we were talking about Wanarovich, and, and I, I think I'm probably one of the only professors who's spoken to them, you know, at length about the AIDS era, you know, and then also, um, and because, um, you know, David was a visual artist and also a poet, and, and I was talking to them about the interdisciplinary nature, nature, and then somebody who had political concerns, and I think that that was a really important example for the students. Um, but, hmm, I'm just trying to think, you know, I don't know, I really want to see some bridges being built, you know, in terms of, of um, I mean, I talk about women, you know, I talk about, you know, being of that era, I talk about Audre Lorde, um, I talk about, um, I go, you know, I'm in, um, on the board of visual aids and I also do a, little, a lot of talks now about that period and I'm always talking about my peers um, because one of the other things that happened is that activism is completely attributed to like ACT UP and it was like I was friends with all of these women like Audre Lorde, like Cheryl Clark, like Sapphire, like all these people, all these poets and Essex and Donald and, um, and basically we couldn't get arrested, yeah. you know, and so the bottom line is we made art you know, 
And so in that regard, people like just attribute this activism to, again, like white people. But it was like it was across the board. Do you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm very strong about is like not wanting these histories to be segregated. I don't want it to be segregated around color. I don't want it to be segregated around gender. I want to find a way that we can, you know, be inclusive. Yeah. Adam Weinberg, in the very first essay at the in the catalog for the Warner Robert show, talks about the ambivalent position of the gallery itself in relation to the social movements of its time, mm -hmm. and the the, the, the awkwardness or, or delicacy of that. Can you elaborate? Well, the galleries in the East Village, some of these shows was they could be one day. They were it was basically a series of pop up shows. They could be in the a disco, they could be in the coffee shop, but there would be these sort of one day, two day events and there would be like the theme of the moment. And I think there was a lot of art being made, but it whittles, when you start looking at people like Peter and like David, I would say also like Martin Wong, mm -hmm. um, Nan Golden, they, these are the people that really delve below that initial, yes, they're part of this party scene, but at the same point, they're not the scene. Mm -hmm. They are going, they're, they're almost subversive because their work, the more you look at it, the more it eats into you and it eats into your soul and into how you think. And I think that's something that um, David's writing almost goes down to what is the essence of being a human yeah. and caring and the anger that we as humans of matter, male, female, color, white, black, green, purple, whatever, that it is a <coughs> there's something very much a human quality mm. that has to come out. You talked about eat away. I've got to ask you about how Peter ended his life. Um, he didn't make a lot of money off this no, work. And the work is now worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. How do you make sense of that? Uh, and how? what do we need to learn about how artists can benefit from the, the work that they're creating? Mm -hmm. um, um, Hucho has got an ambivalent relationship, as you mentioned, to commercial success. And a comment that he made to a friend who was consistently employed was jobs are unimportant, meaning you should be able to live as poor as you need to in order to do the work that you care about, to do the art that really matters. Um, and uh, I think an important dimension of what goes on in explaining the dynamic between these artists and explaining the East Village scene in the 1980s is it's the last time in Manhattan that there's a culture and a community of this scale in the shadow of money. It's not in the boondocks, it's not across the river, it's not uh, something separate from Wall Street, it's a sh short ride. And I think it's that, it's simultaneously the awareness on the part of the artists in the community that they're uh, 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 an enemy camp of some, of some kind, not, not in a, a strictly political sense, but in a sense of they're a, it's a culture that's about something distinct, which is no longer possible uh, uh, in Manhattan. It's just something which has been literally priced out. And I think it's also, uh, as much as we mourn the loss of the various artists, the loss of the audience in the AIDS crisis uh, is, I think, um, the sort of unspoken swell uh, there that, that, that you have to recognize. There's never again been an American audience of that sophistication and uh, attunement and connection here at the center of uh, museum activity and of uh, performance and, and uh, you know, everything else that goes on in, in Manhattan. Um, and um, uh, that quality of being sort of this, uh, this outside camp that is not outside but is right in the midst of mm. the city um, is a thing that it's very hard to talk about uh, regaining. It was certainly it a shock for a lot of white men. When you look at the sort of the generation, say, Oh, in the 80s, or the, well, no, the 90s, 80s and early 90s, the amount of 
people in the art schools and dance schools and the whole thing, how they talked about losing a whole generation of mentors, people who weren't there anymore, who were just when they died of AIDS or right at that point where they were mm. having something to say and to do and they weren't there yeah. and they it wasn't being a able to pass this on. And I think that's why what survives the writing or the photographs or the paintings or whatever it is the that survives is the way that I think a new generation now is coming back and saying, wait, this is what I've been looking for. I hear so much resonance um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the surfacing of loss, the, the, the surfacing of grief. Um, there are many communities that have experienced that level of grief and slaughter and, and being ignored. I hope that from this moment we can figure out how to distill something that pulls these experiences together with full force. Um, you're going to take us out, Pamela. You might have a final comment, but you're also going to perform. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to set up what you're going to perform? Um, well, one, you know, I mean, it's interesting because um, I just wrote this book, Sweet Dreams, and it's, it's a memoir piece, and it's part of a larger memoir. And, um, and, you know, funny enough, uh, a lot of it is about like child abuse. It's personal, it's political. Um, and so, and interestingly enough, you know, I mean, I feel like uh, there's, there's something about like, I mean, if you're a woman of color, people are like, you know, suck it up, you know, <laughs> like, of course, you know, but I was actually, you know, for the show, I was looking again at like Lona Rovage and I was looking again at Hujar and I was like, and I felt this incredible permission you know, um, that both of them were so bold and certainly, you know, David in talking about very difficult subjects and speaking from an interdisciplinary, you know, place. And so I felt like, you know, thank God, you know, again, I can like look to him and say, you know what, okay, there are people who are doing this, who are, who are outspoken and that we can, you know, speak the unspeakable. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, um, and then I wanted to also say, you know, I, I wrote um, something for Avram Finkelstein's new book, um, and I think a history of AIDS through its images. And, um, and basically one of the things that I think is happening in this period too, is that it's kind of like, you know, like after the Holocaust, there was a whole period where artists could not um, write, like writers couldn't write, people just couldn't speak. And it was just, it was just huge. And I feel like like what's happening in this period is that we're kind of like defrosting. Yeah. I mean, you know, that there's like- You're getting permission. Right, you know, like, you, but there's PTSD and then, you know, we're here and then finally decades later, you know, we can like start to finally articulate what happened mm. because mm. it was such, we were so bombarded, yeah. you know? Thank you all for your work. We could keep talking obviously for hours. The Peter Hujar show closes in New York on May 20th at the Morgan, but goes to Berkeley and that opens in July. At the Whitney, the Warnerovich show opens on the 13th of July. Formally to the public. Formally to the public. <laughs> and closes at the end of September, so don't delay endlessly to get getting there. It will travel after that to Madrid, and we have other parts as well. Thank you all for being with us. Um, Pamela, over to you. Rope-a-dope for Sandra Blonde. I had just begun to relax, celebrate the marriage equality ruling. I had just begun feeling with Obama. I was watching Ali in trouble, off the ropes, delivering to his opponent the rope-a-dope my father's eyes, excitement. I was just beginning to breathe air, feel exhilarated at images of Joe Biden and President Obama running down halls of the White House with rainbow flags, like boys with kites soaring. I was just beginning to forgive deaths of my brothers to AIDS, not forget. There should still be tribunals for them and every woman abused by the medical system. I had just begun to turn a corner on Mike Brown, Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, the massacre at AME, not think of it all, every day. And then the police killed this young black girl in custody in Texas, claimed she committed suicide. I remember we're a war nation. 
in war times. I imagine how James Bayard, Nina felt seeing a nation turn its dogs, teeth, gas, hoses, bullets on children and adults. I can't stop thinking about Steve Biko, his battered face. They say he hung himself too. The world's outrage. Who will pray now for us? America. An excerpt of David Wonorovich, One Day This Kid. One day, families will give false information to their children, and each child will pass down that information generationally to their families, and that information will be designed to make existence intolerable for this kid. One day, this kid will begin to experience all this activity in his environment, and that activity in information will compel him to commit suicide or to submit to danger in hopes of being murdered or, to, or submit to silence and invisibility. He will be subject to loss of home, civil rights, jobs, and all conceivable freedoms. All this will begin to happen in one or two years when he discovers he desires to place his naked body on the naked body of another boy.